Good, good afternoon or good morning, wherever you all are. Thank you for joining us. My name is Gail DeGeorge and I'm the editor of Global Sisters Report. We're so glad to have so many of you with us for what will be a fascinating discussion today about women, deacons and women religious with Dr. Phyllis Zagano. So now I'd like to introduce our guests. Uh, Dr. Phyllis Zagano is a senior research associate in residence and adjunct professor of religion at Hofstra University in New York. She has served as a member of the Pontifical Commission for the Study of the Diaconate of Women. Her most recent books include Women, Icons of Christ, and Women Deacons, Essays with Answers. A series of webinars about women deacons can be found on her website, and her column, Just Catholic, is published by National Catholic Reporter. Global Sisters Report just completed running a series of five essays about women religious and women deacons, and that will serve as the basis of as much of our discussion today. Sister Colleen Gibson, is a sister of St. Joseph of Philadelphia. She's a regular Horizons columnist for Global Sisters Report, and she's the author of the blog Wandering in Wonder, and has been published in various periodicals, including America, Commonweal, and Give Us This Day. She currently serves as the coordinator of services at the Sisters of St. Joseph Neighborhood Center in Camden, New Jersey. She's been moderating a monthly webinar with Dr. Zagano about women deacons for, oh gosh, now, you said almost two years now, right, Sister Colleen? Yeah. So, all right, so I'm gonna to turn to Sister Colleen to start it all, us off and to lead us in prayer. Thank you so much, Gail, and thank you for having us and to everybody who's here. Uh, it's wonderful to share this space, even if it's just uh, digitally. So I'd invite you as we begin to just take a moment to pause, uh, bring yourself into this space with all the people who have gathered for this conversation and let us pray. Loving God in every age, you have called women to serve the church as disciples rooted in your love. You have called women to lives of service as vowed religious and as deacons, each serving the people of God in their own way. From those who listened to Christ preach the good news and felt compelled to follow the way, to those who today live lives dedicated to you in a way that preaches the gospel in their very being, we give thanks for the vibrancy of your spirit at work in our church and our world. As we gather in conversation this day, open our hearts to your word and to your presence, which fills this space that we share. In the same way that Paul admonished and extorted the Romans to receive the deacon Phoebe, help us to be receptive to your will and attentive to the needs of our times. Give us the courage and the confidence to follow your call wherever it may lead and the freedom to engage all situations with a spirit of charity and service. Open our minds and our hearts to all that you offer us this day, that we might be enlightened by hope, bolstered in faith, and reflective of your love. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Great. Thank you so much for a lovely opening prayer. So I wanted to check with our, our, our presenters today, because before we get to the question, the first question about women deacons, we had some news that we wanted to talk about. And I wanted to ask both of you your reactions to the announcement of Sister Nathalie Becquart, who was named by Pope Francis as one of the two Synod undersecretaries. So I'm gonna to turn to you Phyllis first, and then to Colleen, what is the signal about women having more of a role at the Vatican? Well, it, it signals exactly what the Holy Father said, that he wanted women to have a more incisive presence in the church. Um, <clears throat> but you know what? Uh, uh, I would like to think about uh, Sister Becquart's uh, uh, appointment as uh, the most uh, qualified person was appointed as an undersecretary, period. Um, I think that the Holy Father wants to open up uh, non-ordained offices to the non-ordained. Um, we know that on the 10th of uh, January, the Feast of the Baptism of the Lord, uh, he uh, changed canon law, canon 230 paragraph one, and all he had to do was remove the word male. Uh, so, and he said in that, in some, um, in, in the document, um, uh, Spiritus Domini, that any place where a lay person is specified male, that's to be taken out. So it's not, not, I haven't, I'm not a canonist. I haven't studied the whole, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the length and breadth of canon law on where lay persons uh, are specified as males. But I think he's made it very clear 
that the laity are the laity, male and female, and the laity as the laity, male and female, can fulfill any task, duty, or office in the church that is uh, is open to the laity. Great. Thank you. Sister Colleen, what are your thoughts? What was I your reaction to the news? Uh, it was thrilling. I mean, really, I woke up and uh, it was, I actually had to double check the news. Uh, I couldn't believe it. And so I think it's something that really is filled with hope. Uh, and as Phyllis said, you know, it's, it's the person most suited to the job and she just happens to be a woman. But I think it's important to have uh, female voices at the table. And so to have that in the midst of the Senate of Bishops and in the next time that the Senate gathers, that hopefully she'll have a vote to go with that voice. Uh, but that presence, I think, you know, to be able to witness to the life that she leads her, when you look at her resume and all that she's done, she brings all of those people who she's ministered with, the youth that she's ministered with in France, she brings all of them to the table with her. Uh, and I think that's a real gift. And as we look at synodality and Phyllis's column that came out today about synodality, uh, you really, you want as many voices as you can to really discern what the spirit is saying. And so for me, um, it was like a high five from the Holy Spirit, you know, that, you know, there was an indication there is hope um, as we listen to more and more voices and more and more people are welcome to the table. That's great. That's great. A high five on the Holy Spirit. I love that. Great. So Phyllis, you know, you, you, you approached me about writing these five essays uh, about women religious and women deacons. And, you know, we talked, you and I talked, but I'm not sure that, you know, our, our guests have had the full benefit of the discussion that you and I had. So what prompted you to, to choose this, to say, you know, I, I need to write a series of essays specifically about women religious and women deacons? Well, here's the deal. Um, the, the, and I was thinking about this a uh, couple, of, couple of days ago. Um, the, the fact of women religious is sometimes the first thing that comes to people's mind when they think about women deacons. And I'll tell you, and, and, and I can recall, and it's gotta be 20 years ago, I was on the Metro in, in Washington, DC, going up to Catholic uh, University, and there was a Franciscan bishop from uh, South America there. And I said, well, what do you think about women deacons? He said, I'd love them. I've got plenty of religious I'd like to ordain. And, and, and I, I said, that, that's very interesting because now you fast forward to the, um, uh, to the meeting of the International Union of Superiors General, the UISG in May of 2016. And you find that the sisters um, of their six questions, really two had to do with women deacons. And uh, basically one of them said, you know, we're already doing the work of the diaconate. So why don't you ordain us? And why don't you have a commission to figure that out? Um, and then when you get to 2019 to the center uh, for the Pan-Amazon region, you find that uh, two things. One, that uh, approximately two thirds of the parishes and parish uh, um, uh, groupings in the Amazon Synod are, are managed by women, mostly by women religious. And secondly, nine of the 12 language groups, uh, which had women at the table, uh, asked for women deacons. It didn't quite come out that way in, I think, paragraph 1, 103 in the final document, but there was a strong emphasis and a strong interest in women in the diaconate at the Amazon Synod. So, um, you know, add that together with some of the research I've been doing actually with Colleen. Um, years ago, we had some Zoom meetings with uh, men and women religious kind of preparing to help uh, CARA, the Center for Applied Research in the uh, Apostolate of Georgetown University, to do a survey uh, on what religious uh, male and female thought about women deacons. It came back, of course, 74, 75% uh, positive. But, but I've been gathering questions, and uh, I get a lot of questions when I speak publicly, and, I, and I've got a whole shoebox full of questions, but I uh, the, the questions relative to religious life are specific to religious life, and, and they just didn't fit, and uh, I don't think they will fit, maybe they will fit, uh, in, in the larger book I'm writing, answering the questions that I've gotten over the years. So kind of that's where it is. In fact, I was going to ask you if there was a particular question or issue that seemed to keep cropping up with the women religious aspect that, that maybe crystallizes the difference in how a woman religious might approach the idea of women deacons or becoming a deacon versus a non a, a woman who's not part of a vowed religious community. Well, you know, there are, there are 
two ways of looking at it. I was at the uh, International Union of Superiors General, the UISG meeting in May of 2019. And the Holy Father said, well, come on down and ask me some questions. Well, the first sister that came down said, uh, when are you gonna ordain us? And the second sister said, we don't wanna be ordained. Mm -hmm. And that, that's basically the, uh, the tension that you'll find. And I, I say to folks, you know, that's, that's not at all unusual because the call to religious life, and Colleen can certainly speak better to this than I, the call to religious life is specific. It's a specific way of living, uh, living our baptismal promises. And, and, and um, that's distinct. Uh, it's a specific way of living the Christian lifestyle distinct from one's profession. I mean, one can be a religious and a deacon, one can also be a religious and a dentist. Uh, so I, I, I think that uh, we just need to bifurcate the issues here and, and not confuse them. One does not replace the other, even though um, it would seem to me that religious life is an example of the, um, the Holy, Holy Spirit calling people to perform diaconal service in many places, both male and female uh, religious communities uh, founded for diaconal works, which had been abandoned by the church. Interesting, good points. Colin, Sister Colleen, I'm gonna to turn to you. Uh, you wrote a very thoughtful column uh, for Global Sisters Report in August about befriending Phoebe and your discovery as an adult about her role, a very important role in the early church. As you wrote, St. Paul told the Romans to graciously receive Phoebe and give her any help she needed. At this time in our world, in our church, can't we ask the same, that women be received in the Lord and given all the help they need to truly share their gifts and ministry in the church? Can we think creatively about what has been and what could be? So clearly you're connecting with Phoebe's role and I'm wondering if you can share a little bit more about your experience of discovering her for the first time, how it's affected you and what your hope is for that creativity that's possible as we explore this role of women as deacons. Thanks, yeah. Um, I really wrote about you know this sense that, I think in young adulthood, I discovered a lot of women in the church who had, hadn't been you know, at the fore for me um, before. And it wasn't until just a few years ago that Phoebe really kind of jumped out to me um, and exploring this fact that it was, she almost had this like unembodied name um, that, you know, I had these early women of the church and she fell in that category. Like Phoebe, I could say, oh, Phoebe was a, an early woman of the church, but I didn't really know anything about Phoebe. And, and looking more deeply into it as I learned about her that, you know, Paul refers to her, he calls her three things, you know, he calls her our, our sister, a deacon and a benefactor. Um, and, and going, I think more deeply into prayer with her, uh, to explore, you know, who, really, who was she? Because it's just these two verses in Romans chapter 16 uh, that mention her. But the fact that she's mentioned, she's the first uh, mentioned woman deacon, uh, it's documented right there. And that she was the one who was entrusted to carry the letter to the Romans, which, you know, Paul's longest epistle, it's this, you know, beautiful, systemic, uh, systematic, you know, exploration of Paul's theology and the theology of Christianity. Uh, and that this woman, this deacon was sent with it. And that, you know, I think about in sitting with her and, and really befriending her as this coworker that, you know, Paul sent her in his place, which meant, you know, she wasn't just carrying a letter. She wasn't just, you know, a male person delivering this letter. Like she was gonna have to explain it. She was gonna, so she had to be a strong woman. She was a courageous woman that she traveled this distance and, you know, that he recommends her and says, you know, I vouch for her and receive her as you would receive me. Um, there was something beautiful about that. So I think getting to know her and then uh, inhabiting space with her and, and really giving life to her uh, and in prayer. And so I think then, you know, the inspiration that she provides when we think about how can we creatively think about the church and about the ministry of women um, and say, you know, how, how is it that this woman who, you know, was living in the first century, um, how is it that she is inspiring me today? Uh, and that the creativity that, you know, there are always new possibilities for ministry. You know, there, there are gifts that need to be shared. And so I think when we look at the church, like one of the inspiring things about the church is all of the wonderful charitable works that the church does. And, and Phyllis touches on this in her essays, but you know, there's a parallel structure. Women religious run a, a multitude of charitable works. Um, 
and saying, you know, where are the deacons of the church? You know, when the permanent diaconate was reinstated at Vatican II, uh, what did that mean? And what did what did those, you know, council fathers envision for the diaconate? And and has that come to pass? And so how can we think creatively about what deacons should be doing and the works of charity and I think melding word and deed together? And that's for me, that's really the exciting piece of what deacons do is, you know, they're able to preach the word, but they preach the word from a place of having put it into action. And so uh, I think when we think creatively as a church, uh, it's trying to say, you know, how do we put our words into action and how do our actions reflect the words that we preach uh, each and every day? That's great. Wonderful. And very insightful answer. Thank you very much. So to both of you, I'm going to ask, and I'll turn to Phyllis first, uh, you've been holding this series of webinars about women deacons that have been very well attended. Um, I guess, have you been surprised yourself at the sustained level of interest on this topic of women deacons? And there have been, as Phyllis noted, um, over there's four or five Vatican commissions about the role of deacons since the early 70s, none of which recommended against women deacons, and yet we still don't have women deacons. But I'm just curious, what are your thinking about why, you know, why this level of interest by the wider church community, despite what seems to be the Vatican's resistance to truly address this need in the church? So Phyllis, I'm going to turn to you first and then Colleen. The Vatican, I didn't catch that. The Vatican's what's the, va what's the reason for the, there's two, it's a two-pronged question. One is, you know, why this level of interest, I guess, and I guess, but it's against this backdrop of the Vatican's resistance. I mean, people seem to, you know, be really taken by this idea of women deacons, despite the fact that uh, the Vatican hasn't moved much on this issue. Well, you know, I'm not going to disparage what goes on in, in the Vatican today. I think uh, it's not necessarily the Vatican um, that is, uh, is uh, having trouble with women um, being restored to the ordained diaconate. I, th I think it's a far deeper problem. It, it redounds to clericalism. It redounds to poorly formed priests who uh, um, simply can't handle the idea of women being near the sacred. This is not a new problem um, in the church. Uh, uh, it, it, it's about 1500 years old that uh, there was a certain hysteria about women being near the sacred, which is why the change to Canon 230 paragraph, uh, uh, paragraph one is so important that any lay person is any lay person. Um, but I think the interest is, is two part. Certainly now, a part of the interest is everybody's stuck at home and you might wanna have a conversation about this that you wouldn't ordinarily be able to have. Uh, but also, I think there's a, a renewed interest and an energy, uh, particularly of women, Colleen and Bell better, uh, than I, uh, but I think we get a, a preponderance of women signing up for the uh, for the webinars, and we have a lot of repeat uh, repeat uh, uh, visitors to the webinars um, because they want to know what can they do. Uh, you know that that there's there's a a feeling that you know first of all you know we didn't know about this, and and then there becomes an anger. If, why didn't they tell us about this? And then what can we do? And, and the what can we do is kind of not my department, but except for me to say, well, you need to talk about it. The Holy Father speaks deeply about discernment. The, the column that Colleen mentioned that I, I ran today in National Catholic Reporter speaks about the question of synodality, you know, and, and, and well, what is synodality? Half the people can't pr pronounce it and the other half can't spell it. You know, it's, it, it's a, uh, a concept that we're all in this together. Um, and, and it revolves around basically three words, communion, participation, and mission. And uh, so I think that the, the people of God, particularly the women who come to, our, to our, our webinars over the past two years are saying, you know, we want to stay to be part of the church. We're in communion. Uh, we want to participate. Uh, we, we, want to, we want to do what we can as, as, and, and participate as full members. Uh, and we want to participate in the mission, and that mission being the diaconal mission of the church. Uh, so uh, I would say that, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the Holy Spirit will, will do what the Holy Spirit will do. And uh, it's not a question, I think, of the Vatican only thinking about this. It's a question of the people of God 
discussing it. I, I can assure you the Holy Father wants the people of God to discuss about it and primarily to pray about it. Uh, because if the church needs women deacons, it will not be denied. Okay. So Colleen, what about you, Sister Colleen? Uh, I think, you know, something that I've learned over the course of these last two years doing these webinars um, is that people really appreciate a felt sense of community. And I think, you know, the sense of, you know, during the pandemic, this is the way that we naturally gather. You know, Zoom is, is our modus operandi. But uh, because we can't gather in person, it has opened up this whole new way to connect with people. And so um, this sustained level of interest, I know the one of the sisters I live with, when I come home from these webinars, she goes, wait, you had another webinar on, on women deacons? Like, how did, really? You're still doing that? Um, but people come back, you know, time and time again, and we built a community uh, where all are welcome. We have new people every time. And so there are some questions we always address over again. And then there are uh, people who are there for the conversation and there for the long run. And, you know, like any community, you know, we have our characters, uh, we have people who we know what questions are going to be coming from them. Um, but I think there's, there's hope that people believe that there's movement in the church. And I think even just in the last, you know, few years, we've seen uh, some of that movement, you know, the, the change to the canon, uh, you know, to have lectors and, and acolytes, the, you know, that there, there's a movement in that, you know, I know growing up, you know, I was an altar server, but for, for many of the women who come to our, you know, webinar, that wasn't a reality for them. So to have that, you know, instated and, and to have, you know, the Vatican say, to have the canon reflect that, uh, there's something of hope in that. And I think after our webinars, I, I, I take in all of these questions uh, that, I, that I curate and, and offer to Phyllis, uh, but they, of, they often come with stories. And so people will tell me about, you know, Anne, who served in the parish office at our church, and she managed the finances, and if anybody should be a woman deacon, Anne should be a woman deacon. Mm -hmm. Or I hear from people who say, you know, uh, my parish is, was a wonderful place, and then um, they changed our pastor, and everything has changed, and, and it's just gone amok. And, and the sorrow and the grief that's in, in those messages, um, but people believe that they're being heard, uh, and are able to hear other people reflect that back. So I think people are recognizing, uh, witnessing, and participate. They feel like they're participating in this movement. Uh, and you know, people, as Phyllis said, often say, you know, what can I do? You know, we say you can write letters. You can. Uh, you need to have the conversations. You need to continue uh, engaging. You know, I need to come back home to the convent at night and say I was on another uh, webinar about women deacons because people are interested in this issue, people care about it, people are passionate about it. Uh, and as Phyllis said, you know, the Holy Spirit will not be, will not be denied. Um, so I think people are really hopeful to be able to be engaged in, in a movement and to see some of that movement, um, you know, two steps forward and one step back, but to, to recognize that there is movement and, and that the church is a living, uh, moving, breathing organism that we're all a part of. Well, you should both be commended for having those conversations that Phyllis talks about, you know, again, that, that, you know, the Holy Father wants us to be having about this topic. So thank you both. I've attended several of the webinars and they're, they're wonderful. So Phyllis, I'm going to turn to a slightly uh, different question. In your latest book, which I have right here, uh, Women Icons of Christ, you detail the history uh, of the role of women deacons and the support and the opposition to them by members of the male church uh, hierarchy. And it's, it's a well-written, you know, organized, argued book. But all that said, I found personally that I could only read a few passages of it at a time because it frankly made me so angry. And at times I have to admit disheartened at the blatant misogyny that bars so much of our church and its history and is even an evident among some of the present day bishops. So I have to ask you, after studying this topic for so many years, how have you had the spiritual fortitude to stay with this? and not get so discouraged. Not well, I have, you know, I mean, it, it, I've had support and, and, and uh, I pray about it. And, and it's just something that I feel that, uh, uh, when I was in college, uh, one of my roommates said, you know, take me as I am or the heck with you. And, and so I guess that might be my attitude. I, I just feel that uh, I was brought up, uh, uh, my mother and father said, you can be anything you want to be. And, and I always had that, uh, uh, that attitude. Uh, but I, but I, I think um, 
I, I am convinced uh, that the church can ordain women as deacons. I'm not so sure uh, uh, I would be able to tell any one bishop, you, you should have women deacons in your diocese. And as I've said, oftentimes on the webinar, I, I'm reminded of John of Salamis in the fifth century, I think, who said to the bishop in the next diocese, I have women deacons, but I know you don't like them. So I don't let mine go over as missionaries to your, to your area. Um, uh, the, 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 um, uh, the point of fortitude, I, I kind of sometimes just laugh at, you know, you silly guys. Uh, um, the, uh, I, have, I have before me a document on, um, on leadership by Cardinal Cherney. It's a, it's a paper that he gave. I don't have it marked, but it's very early up. And he's talking about synodality and, and uh, how we, we need to, to uh, discuss things and everybody needs to discuss things. And then in the middle of it someplace, I can't quite put my finger on it, he says, you know, we really have to have fraternal discussion. And I was like, oh boys, you know, give me a break. Uh, the, 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 but that's, that's the least of it. That's, that's the remnants of the um, misogyny you're talking about in this book, you know, uh, Perfect Gift for Your Friends and Family. I, it's the third chapter, I think, Gail, that you're, you're concerned about, um, and it's the chapter on altar service, uh, where it is uh, quite clearly laid out that because women are um, unclean, impure, and stupid, uh, they cannot be near the sacred. And uh, I, uh, uh, I, I don't take kindly to those words, but on the other hand, I just kind of laugh at them because we hate in others what we hate in most in ourselves, you know? So, um, but that's the chapter in this book. And I think I told you this, Gail, don't read it before you go to bed. Um, <laughs> because it's, it's very annoying. Um, but it's quite, it's quite clear in the book that uh, Matthew Blastaris is a uh, uh, canonist in the, uh, in the uh, Greek canonist in the uh, 14th, 15th century says that uh, it was permitted for women to approach the altar and go about the tasks of the male deacons much like them but they've been prevented by later fathers, both from ascending to this, that is to the altar, and from pursuing the tasks of this ministerial service because of the involuntary flow of their menses. I was like, well, grow up boys, would you please? Uh, I mean, um, I can't think of his name. It's, it's one of the Gregory's. Uh, no, it's not one of the Gregory's. Yeah, it is. Um, no, it's, it's Eastern, uh, who said, come on, it's a, it's a natural, normal function. There's nothing dirty about it, you know, get a life. And, and so the superstition um, combined with what I like to think of as a treehouse mentality, you know, uh, no girls allowed, the sign says no girls allowed, um, has kept us on the other side of uh, what I heard a liturgist call the fence, the, the altar rail. And, uh, and that's been going on for 1500 years. So as we began, uh, and it's very interesting that women now can officially be installed to the remnants of minor orders the minor orders of uh, lector, porter, exorcist, and acolyte now replaced by the installed ministries of uh, installed lay ministries of lector and acolyte. We're now officially allowed on the other side of the fence. And that, that's a big deal. Interesting, good point. So Colleen, uh, what you know keeps you hopeful? And then there's a question that's related to this but that's coming in from one of the audience members. But let's, let's just stay with this for a moment. What keeps you hopeful about women's role in the church? What truly change? Yeah, I, I mean, in terms of women's roles in the church, um, I think what keeps me hopeful about uh, women deacons and that we're having this conversation um, and what keeps me hopeful about religious life, you know, kind of this melding of the two is, is the same, you know, that the, the gospel call is there and we need to respond to it and the needs of the world are so great uh, that how could we not? And, you know, I love that Phyllis said, you know, you have to laugh, you know, mm -hmm. and, and that sense of like, you know, to say that it isn't possible or to say, uh, that the needs aren't great enough. You, in some ways, you just have to laugh in the face of that. You have to, you have to take heart. You have to have the courage uh, to be able to step forth and, and serve in the ways in which you feel called to serve. And I think, you know, that's reflected in the history of religious life. Um, it's, you know, there was a need and so women set out to serve it. And so today, what are the needs of our world and how are we setting out to serve it? And 
to be able to witness that and see it in so many ways. I know the ministry that I do right now, you know, a sister uh, in the 1940s you know, who was teaching in the grade school never would have imagined, you know, going out on the streets and, and running a community center. And she never would have pictured me. Uh, mm -hmm. That wasn't in the mindset, but uh, there's hope that our church is constantly evolving and our way of life is constantly evolving and that we're listening to the spirit. And I think there's a lot of hope in seeing the movement in different areas in our world, you know, that this isn't just a North American thing. It's not just the American church uh, that's having this conversation. Um, you know, when you look at the church in Germany, and we talked about the, the synodal way uh, in our webinar on Wednesday, you know, you talk about the German church and how they're thinking about uh, engaging the voices of many people. We get questions oftentimes from uh, people in Africa, people in Southeast Asia who say, you know, uh, is there a need? Where, where are, you know, where are the bishops on this in my area? Because there are needs here. And so I want to serve that. How can I? And you look at the synod on the Amazon, you know, it was front and center there. So I think uh, the fact that people are naming the needs and we're trying to figure out ways to serve those needs. And, and there's hope in that, you know, that um, hope endures and, you know, nothing is insurmountable. And so uh, how can we be present? How can we show up uh, and, and know that God is showing up with us? Uh, so I think there's great hope in that, that there are many ways to live the gospel that Jesus set forth many, many, you know, millennia, you know, centuries ago. Um, there's ways to live this and, and we're empowered and people find life and I find joy and life in doing that. So I think there's always hope in that and seeing people who are engaged and passionate about it. Let's get in. In fact, you know, what you've answered may answer address this question that's come in from our, our participants, but I want to ask it because this is a, a teacher at an all girls school and she says that her students who will probably be listening to this later are often disheartened at what they perceive as a suppressive structure. This, you know, if God is present in many faiths, why do they stay in a church that excludes them? Uh, so, you know, she's asking Dr. Zagato and Sister, you know, Colleen, why do you stay? So again, you know, if you have a short answer into what you just said. Uh, who's who's going to answer me? Yes, yeah, so I guess I'll go to you first, folks. Huh. Uh, well, it's my church you know, and uh, you're not going to throw me out of it. I, th I think that's the, the, first, uh, the first response. Uh, I happen to believe um, the teachings of, of Catholic theology, so that's another reason. Um, but uh, I can understand uh, where young people are simply walking away. You know, I read the, the wedding uh, announcements in the New York Times every Sunday, and I can't tell you in the past six months if I've seen three happening in a Catholic church. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's not just, uh, it's really uh, Colleen's generation. Um, and that is saying, you know, I'm sorry, we're done. Uh, you know, you don't take us seriously, so we're leaving. And, and I, I tell the, the, the men, bishops and cardinals, I had the opportunity to speak to all the time. Um, women are walking away, and and if the the woman does not make her husband go to mass and bring the children, you're not going to have a church anymore, and it's happening very soon, uh, and sooner than you think. I've been told that the uh, synod on synodality, which will happen in October of 2022, uh, pandemic restrictions uh, permitting, um, that that uh, synod will include discussions about women. I was like, it's too late, uh, you know, it really is too late. Uh, but the church is, is a, um, a, a large and lumbering institution. And I think the Holy Father, I know the Holy Father is waiting uh, for, to hear the Holy Spirit speaking throughout the whole church. So the fact is Colleen mentioned that we have uh, comments from India, from Africa, from South America. Um, I certainly hear from many different places on the earth almost daily. Um, the discussion is being held and the discussion needs to uh, find its, its pinnacle if, if, uh, if only at the synod for the uh, synodality, well, okay, but uh, it would be useful, I think, for the church at large to have that happen sooner. Um, so to give the high school people hope, um, you, know, uh, I, you know, just, just keep on keeping on uh, because uh, if you walk away, um, then um, 
then there are other forces in the church that would prefer it to be 1950. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and, we, and we certainly don't need that. Holly, did you call me anything? Yeah, um, what do you say? That, that sense of, uh, you know, nobody can tell me that this isn't my church. You know, I've, I'm baptized and because of that baptism, I have a rightful place here as much as anybody else. Uh, and so I believe that there's enough room in the church for everybody, you know, that, that classic quote about the church, you know, the Catholic church is here comes everybody. And so um, I'm called, I'm called to be here. And so, uh, I'm not going to let anybody discourage me from being here because I do for as flawed as the church can be as as backwards that sometimes it can seem um, it's my church and and I love it and it's the way in which uh, I found my path and and I found myself more deeply and I've grown in relationship with God and and there are so many pieces of of my Catholic faith that I cherish and that I love to to share with people and that brings me into to union with people and and so to say, you know, that, that we're all one in this church and, uh, you know, sometimes it doesn't feel like it, like a, a family, you know, we fight, we, we have some growing pains, um, but nobody can tell me that it's not, it's not my church. And so uh, this call to a radical response, and I think for me, um, the hope of staying is that, is that it can change and that it is a flexible institution and it may you know we were talking about the sundial the other night you know the church sets its sundial it doesn't even set its watch uh, it takes its time to make change um, but believing that my presence makes a difference just as every other person's presence in the church makes a difference it makes a difference to the person who i encounter each day for whom i'm the face of the church who i'm the face of jesus and for the person who i encounter who i see the face of jesus in uh, and so that's what makes the difference. That's what, you know, oftentimes we can kind of get caught up in the headlines. We can get caught up in the big news of the church um, and recognizing that, you know, our faith is something that's lived. It's something that's engaged in the day to day. Uh, it's the sacramentality of the life that we live. And, you know, go back to Phoebe. Um, nobody is an unembodied name. You know, everybody is a person in front of me uh, and there's the ability to engage and grow. Uh, and find Jesus there. So nobody can tell me that I shouldn't have hope. I'm, I'm gonna hold on to my hope. <laughs> That's great, you're gonna stay in there. Mm -hmm. All right, we've got some other questions that had come in from uh, participants ahead of time. This one came in uh, asking about, well, do some women religious oppose ordination of women as deacons because they don't wanna come under the control of the clergy uh, perceived as supporting this pros uh, prosperity gospel, and then therefore those would not be in line with their ministries to the poor. So if so, if, you know, is, is this the case? Have you heard this reasoning and, and is it a valid reason? So that's the one part of the question. The second part of that same question is, is there a strategy to work for women religious to be ordained as deacons before lay women would be ordained? I, I think, no, I think that's, that's, uh, uh, the second question is a false analogy. The, this discussion is about uh, specific questions relative to um, to to women religious, uh, and and certainly uh, and women religious, by the way, are lay people. Um, in terms of ordaining seculars, uh, secular women, married or single, um, sure, that's that's uh, I've got as I said uh, uh, to you earlier, I've got a whole shoebox of questions about that. Um, in terms of um, not willing to be involved with the, the, the clergy or the hierarchy, well, sure, fine. I, I mean, the, um, the, the, that's a kind of a, a con, uh, conflation of something I wrote, I think, in the fourth or, or fifth uh, essay for GSR. The uh, prosperity gospel um, is, uh, is a problem. And it's a problem, particularly in South America, uh, where it is promising prosperity uh, to, uh, to individuals. And it's primarily presented um, through evangelical uh, Protestantism in South America, where uh, right now, whereas it was something like 90% of the territory was Catholic, now it's down about 60% of the Catholic, and most of them are, are leaving. Uh, uh, so it's it's really a confluence of the beginning and the end of the fifth essay. Um, some women religious do not want to be ordained. Some men religious do not want to be ordained. 
and that's fine. Um, as I uh, think I said earlier, the first question uh, to the Holy Father in May of 2019 was, when are we going to be ordained? And the second question was, we don't want to be ordained. Um, they're, they're different, uh, different uh, questions. One is about uh, the way one lives one's personal life, and the other is about uh, one's, uh, one's profession. Uh, I hate to call the diaconate's profession because it's really a, vo a separate vocation, but uh, the point being clerical and religious life can coexist. Uh, if women um, uh, and women's institutes and orders don't want to include clerics, fine. There, there have been men's uh, religious uh, institutes that have affirmatively voted they do not want clerics uh, in them. And, and so fine, you know. Uh, it, it really depends on uh, maintaining the mission and ministry of the institute. And uh, I find a deep interest in women religious in South America and Central America, uh, both from American you know, missionaries but, and foreign missionaries, German missionaries, and also native, um, uh, native speaking and, and, and uh, individuals from the various countries. They just want to be ordained as deacons to serve the people. They, they, and they're not really upset about uh, having to work for a bishop because they already do, you know, in a way. Uh, so I, I think there are different ways of, uh, of thinking about it. Uh, and I could see where in the United States, particularly, there are a lot of women who would not want to be a cleric uh, in a diocese with a particular bishop. You know, so. Mm -hmm. There's a question that came in um, again ahead of time from a, a participant who said uh, he's a he is he is a member of a, a he's a brother in a clerical male order and he's cautioning about how religious orders and congregations of women have to be very clear about how they're going to function when clerics become part of their membership because he says you know there's a uh, he can't participate fully in the leadership of the order because a lay person according to canon law may not have power over a cleric so how are religious Women really just addressing this question. I think, Phyllis, you did address this question in your series of essays. Yeah, first of all, it's incorrect. Um, uh, it's not just clerics, it's priests. Uh, a lay person cannot have uh, authority or manage uh, affairs, uh, priestly affairs. And uh, the canonist I've spoken to said that deacons uh, in, a woman, in, an, in an institute of men or women uh, would make no difference. Uh, that that the, the problem is not uh, in the diaconate, the problem is with priesthood. Having said that, um, there are discussions now in Rome uh, in sickle cell uh, or with sickle cell with the Congregation for Institutes and Societies of Apostolic and, and, uh, and Religious Life um, about how uh, particularly Franciscans um, and among them the Capuchins uh, could elect a brother as the uh, guardian or the provincial uh, or president, uh, and yet they could still have uh, priests in the in the order. And the way it's it's been worked through, uh, and and there is an example in, in I think my third essay, um, the way it's been worked through is that the brother who is elected um, is the provincial. Uh, but for priestly matters, they elect a, a vicar to handle specifically priestly matters. Uh, the alternative is, uh, and the example that I always think about is Glenstall Abbey uh, outside Limerick, Ireland, where they elected a brother, a monk, uh, and they made him a deacon and made him a priest. And, uh, you know, he was the abbot. But uh, uh, I, it's, it's under discussion, and the Franciscans are leading the discussion, and the Franciscans have determine some workarounds, at least the Capuchins have, um, and the Holy Fathers approve them. <clears throat> so um, I, I, uh, I think women, uh, uh, you know, the other, the other point of this, which he didn't really, this brother who asked this question didn't really bring up, um, I think women um, can get over it a little bit more easily. That is, if a woman is a in the institute or order as a deacon or a dentist or a teacher or a social worker, uh, I think she is a member, a full member of her, of her institute or order and uh, it wouldn't make any difference. Okay, all right, well, thank you for that. Again, a few other questions, we only have time for a few more. Um, 
question coming in, you, I know you've dealt with this several times, um, Phyllis, but it is a question that comes up that, with people. Uh, and they, you know, the, the one qu the question is, um, is there, how does this, this conversation about women, uh, about the ordination of, uh, I'm sorry, the, yes, the ordination of women as deacons relate to the ordination of women to the priesthood? So one train of thought is that women religious would not want to become ordained as deacons because ordination itself is perceived as sexist and unhealthily clerical and patriarchal, and it needs to be completely destructed, reconstructed. So anyway, well, let's deal with a small one first. You know, is there, is there a relation, you know, between uh, ordaining women as deacons uh, and then again, this idea of women priests? No. Okay. So no, they're totally unrelated. This unrelated. It's only around the between the 10th and the 12th century as the diaconate was being basically run out of town. You know, the female diaconate lasted a lot longer uh, as an active service of the church uh, than the male diaconate. We have women deacons up till the 12th century in Northern Italy. Um, <clears throat> but as uh, Gresham was codifying canon law, uh, one could only be ordained a deacon if one was going to be ordained a priest. So we have this uh, really incorrect yoking of the two, the two vocations. Uh, but the, the diaconate is quite simple to make the priesthood and, and they're not related. And if uh, individuals, um, male or female, don't wanna be involved with the so-called male patriarchy, hierarchy, et cetera, et cetera, well, they don't. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, another question has come in. What's the basis for claiming that women should be ordained as deacons? Uh, in other words, is there some sort of can you know, biblical passage, canon law? You would hope, but that can I can refer to? I'm so excited to learn about this. This is someone for whom this discussion is new. Well, yes, all the above. Colleen uh, mentioned earlier, and she can talk more about Phoebe. You know, Phoebe is the only person in scripture uh, with the job title deacon, and she's called deacon. She's not called deaconess. Some of the translations have her as a deacon, as she's a deacon, and and the uh. Uh, the reason, uh, the reasons are, first of all, historically women have been ordained. Secondly, women are equally human to males and therefore can be the sign um, of the risen, uh, the risen Lord. Um, you know, until 2002, when the term in persona Christi servi, in the person of Christ the servant, was kind of invented, um, the um, the deacon was always uh, the individual who worked in Nomine Ecclesiae Christi in the name of the Church of Christ. And so there's a lot of, of uh, splitting and bifurcation of the diaconate and the, the priesthood in, in current writings. In 2009, Pope Benedict XVI put out a document called Omnium and Mentum that basically said the diaconate is not the priesthood. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I think if we, we it all redounds to the point of service. Um, and, uh, you know, Co Colleen can speak better to, to the point of the diaconal service that she does. Uh, you know, um, they, they, I think we're increasingly seeing these distinct vocations, the priesthood and the diaconate. And, uh, but the diaconate itself is really being lived mostly by non-ordained individuals, uh, at least in the United States. Certainly in other countries, they're more, uh, they're more active and certainly in other parts of the United States. I'm in the Northeast. Um, male deacons are very active in, in prison ministry and social services. Uh, but there is always the, and there is the problem of the 47,000 ordained deacons in, in, the, uh, in the world uh, of their becoming clerical. clerical. Uh, clericalism among the deacons, uh, they're becoming, as one uh, Cardinal Archbishop said to me, Sunday dress up guys, mm -hmm. uh, uh, not doing anything other than showing up uh, to be part of the, uh, of the celebration of the Eucharist on Sunday. Mm -hmm. so, I don't know, maybe Colleen can. Well, in fact, it's funny, before Colleen, I'm going to ask this because indeed a question just came in about this saying, you know, that it seems that diaconate needs to be defining uh, on the basis of mission, communion, communion, and participation, the deacons that this person knows um, who have only their only job at serving at the altar, and it seems that they don't want to get their hands dirty in the trenches like women religious do. So, ordaining women as deacons will that cause an overhaul of the diaconate? So, mm -hmm. we can put advice to that. I think it's a it's a good question. Um, I think you know our understanding of what the diaconate is, uh, and as Phyllis said, you know you have these Sunday dress up guys. Um, 
there needs to be a deeper understanding of what the diaconate is. If you look back, Commonweal a few months ago did a, a little feature on the deacon, a couple of essays on it, uh, and really talking about, you know, what's the theology of the deacon? Because I think, you know, when we talk about that, that last question, you know, um, what's the basis that we understand the deacon? And, you know, we have Phoebe, the first named woman deacon uh, in scripture, but, you know, the deacon was called forth from the community. And so, you know, when we talk about religious life, we often say, you know, somebody else identify, helps to identify that call. People name it for you. They say, you know, have you ever thought about this? The same thing when you think about any type of call. Uh, same thing with, you know, the diaconate. The, the deacon really is called forth from the community to serve the community, to be an embodiment of the church. Um, and so I think it, it it is, how do we understand that? Because I think, you know, by and large, I do a lot of service that a deacon would do a diaconal ministry. Um, the, the thing that is missing is that liturgical role, that role within the liturgy um, to be able to, to preach, to preach the word, to uh, proclaim the gospel, uh, not just in the way that I live each day, but uh, from an actual pulpit, um, to be able to you know, witness marriages, to um, be with people, you know, to be at funerals. You know, if, I, if I'm a chaplain and I've accompanied someone along this road of, you know, hospice care or something along those lines, um, who better than the person who has been with, with those individuals through that entire process uh, to then be with them in that celebration of life and that movement in, in the funeral liturgy. Um, so I think, you know, it, it's how do we understand the diaconate? And I mean, I, before I kind of got involved in this project and started learning more about Phoebe, more about women deacons, I don't think I knew what, you know, what deacons were. They were, they were the nice guys at my home parish when I was a little kid who their, de their, uh, their homilies sounded a little bit different than, you know, what father's homily sounded like because they might pull in something different or they seem to have some different experience. Uh, and they looked, you know, they had a different type of, you know, album. Uh, so I noticed that as a little kid, but um, I think it's that question of, you know, how do we understand and do we really understand what deacons are called to do and, and that they're called forth from the community to serve. So I don't think, I think part of the question that you asked Gail is about like a conflict of, of ministry. Um, that I don't see the ministry of deacon being in conflict. I see it being in, in parallel and in conjunction with, you know, the ministry that is done by women, whether they're women religious or they're, you know, lay pastoral ministers, uh, they're just lay women who serve married women um, in whatever way that people serve. I think uh, the role of deacon offers another way of acknowledging that service and, and offering new ways to engage in that service. That's great. Well, thank you very much. We're coming close to our, our hour. We have several other really good questions. And what I promised the participants is that we'll do is we'll capture these questions in our chat and send them to Dr. Zagano and to Sister Colleen so that they can perhaps incorporate them in the webinars that they, they do monthly. So uh, rest assured that your questions will be submitted uh, to both of them for consideration and perhaps in, at their future discussions. So I think I'm gonna wrap it up though, get this, because again, if I ask a question, it won't be fair because it won't be time for a, a, a good complete answer. But I wanted to thank uh, Dr. Zagano and uh, Sister Colleen for joining us today. Um, and I wanted to remind you that there will be an email that's sent out with the recording of this session and some of the, the links to things that you may have heard discussed here, including the, the series of essays that Dr. Zagano wrote for Global Sisters Report. I wanna invite you to join us on March 2nd with Sister Simone Campbell in which she'll be speaking. She is the executive director at Network and she will be speaking about spiritual strength and turbulent times. And she'll be sharing about her experience at Network, how she's kept spiritually grounded during these past four very tumultuous years and some hints at what she plans to do next when she's stepping down at the end of the month, uh, in the end of March rather uh, from Network. So uh, with that, I'm gonna turn to my colleague, we're gonna share a screen and have uh, Dr. Zagano send us off in a prayer. God of light and life. In every age, you have called women and men to your service, to be your voice and your hands in the world, to preach the gospel, put its good news into action. These, your ministers, embody your word. They proclaim it in the liturgy. They practice it in charity. May we and all the people of God support women called to the ordained diaconate 
as we pray that they may fulfill their vocations. Grant your church the courage to restore women to the diaconate. Let it recognize their service, their potential, and their dignity. In faith and hope, we join our prayer with those who have come before us, and we invoke the intercession of the deacon saints, Phoebe, Apollonia, Gorgonia, Melania, Olympus, Radigand, and the many other women who have served you throughout the ages. May they be with us as we journey. Help us as well to guide the discernment of the church so that it may become a greater beacon of hope to our world. And we ask this all in the name of your son, Jesus, through the intercession of your Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Thank you again, Dr. Zagano. Thank you, uh, Sister Colleen. Thank you to all the participants, to my colleagues at National Catholic Reporter and Global Sisters Report who joined us for an enlightening discussion. And blessings on you all. And may we continue to pray to St. Phoebe for her intercession and her help. Thank you.